Hi everyone. Today we're going to be talking about the chemistry of food composition. All basic foods, basic and, and people, and more or less everything that's alive on this planet consist of these six basic nutrient groups. Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur. So by nutrient groups, really what I'm talking about here are the elements. These elements are crucial to all living life on earth or some or most, but especially for us, all of these six are cru uh, crucial. Without them, we don't exist. As far as the different types of components of what are in our food. We have carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, water, minerals, and vitamins. Just a little refresher. A molecule is a unit composed of one or more types of atoms held together by chemical bonds. A compound is a substance whose molecules consist of unlike atoms. So basically what the, a compound is many molecules put together. As far as what our body is put together uh, of, we have 60 to 70% water. That doesn't really vary all that much. It cannot really vary all that much. We need to have that much water in our bodies. A lot of it is also trapped in, in our muscles, in our skeletal muscle. So we have fat, which is 15 to 25%. That can vary. We have proteins, which are 15%, which a lot of that is in our muscle, some in the blood. We also, and organs, we also have minerals. So Obviously, you're watching this and not in class, but I want you to think about where those minerals could be. And hopefully you said bones, blood, and we'll go more into that a little bit as, as we go as we go further. Mainly like calcium, you need it for your bones. Calcium, you also need it for, for your heart. So it's circulating through through your body. Water, the simplest of all nutrients, the most important, it's essential for life. Now, it's essential for life on this planet, on planet Earth. We don't know much about other planets, but this is only for our planet. The way that it's set up exactly uh, makes water so important. And if something with the planet was different, gravity, distance from the sun, temperature, whatever it may be, water as we know it might not be the same and our role, our reliance on it would be different or the way that we interact with it would, would differ than what it is here on earth. So water is one oxygen that has two hydrogen atoms on or one hydrogen atom on either side so it's two high two oxygen bleh, i'm sorry uh excuse me for that so it's one oxygen two hydrogens foods have varying water content so basically you could have pretty close to zero up to 95 percent water fruits and vegetables obviously have predominantly water Whole milk can be 80% water, and we're going to go over milk later on in the semester. Um, about 12% of milk is not water. So water is actually probably close. I'm sorry. Uh, milk is closer to 88% water. Uh, most meats have about 70%. And if you had like a dried or cured meat or a smoked meat or like a beef jerky, that's obviously way more than seven, way less than 70%. I was going to say way more has been removed 
So the percentage of water is, is going to be lower. So the least amount of water, vegetable oils, basically oils don't have any water in them and dried food. So grains, beans, even uh, bread after you toast it is not going to have much water left at all. So something, and we're going to discuss, water is also crucial for microbiological growth or inhibiting microorganisms from growing. So we're gonna talk about that uh, also in the food safety, in regard to food safety and food preservation. Because one of the main ways to preserve food is to remove the water or make the water that is present in the food unavailable to the microorganisms. Here are some examples. Take a look at the differing percentages of oil, I'm sorry, of water. Now, one of the things that, uh, like I said, oil has zero water in it. But take a look, some of these might surprise you. Uh, tomato and watermelon are pretty much all water. Um, Swiss cheese is about 37%. A cooked hamburger is still 60%. So you're not losing much there, but maybe there's one that surprises you. So, as staying with water and talking about measuring heat energy, heat basically moves the molecules of water through different states. So the more heat, the higher the energy contained in the water, the more the molecules are going to move. So, and if it gets hot enough, the molecules will be able to break that threshold, the surface of the water and release into steam. So the one of the basics for how we even measure calories, that's our heat energy, is the big C calorie, which is basically a kilocalorie, which, which represents 1,000 calories. So when you look at a nutrition facts panel on a food, in the United States, it's going to have big C calories. So those represent, one calorie represents 1,000 kilocalories. So a kilocalorie, or one big C calorie, is the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one kilogram of water, one degree Celsius. So what that means is if you had a pot of water, one kilogram of water, and you had a thermometer in this pot of water, you would need to apply one kilocalorie or one big C calorie worth of energy to raise the temperature one degree Celsius. Specific heat, this is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance one degree Celsius. So the way that water works on Earth is different than a lot of other compounds that we would interact with. So one of the crazy things or interesting things has to do with the what happens to water as it freezes. Water when it freezes into a solid or ice is actually less dense than liquid water. Not all substances behave this way. Not all compounds have this characteristic. And we know or we're exposed to this cool little trick that water does uh, as young children when we notice that if you put ice cubes into a drink, they're going to float to the top. And ice cubes float or ice floats in water because it's less dense. Even though it's solid, meaning that the molecules are more closely packed together, it is still less dense, so it floats. Here are the different phases. So 
you have liquid water in the middle where the water molecules are kind of moving away from each other. They're moving around, but they don't break that surface. They don't break the water surface. That, and the water surface is basically that line where this is the water surface, the top of the water. Up in this area is air. Below is just the water molecules moving around. When you get to solid water or ice, the molecules get more compacted and move a little bit slower and they form a solid. As heat is added to the ice, it begins to melt to become liquid water. And if you continue to heat liquid water, you would get ga the gas phase or steam. Now, Something to keep in mind is the steam or the gas phase, basically the temperature of the water, and I'm doing this with my hands because this I'm trying to represent the molecules. They're getting excited from the heat and that heat energy is making them move more rapidly and they're moving rapidly enough that they can overcome the pressure of the air that's pushing down on the top of the water. So they start to bubble out. And when the water molecules bubble out, break through that surface into the air and release steam, what do we know that as? What do we call that? It's boiling. So water is boiling when it can when the bubbles the enter the molecules have enough energy to break through that surface and push out into the air they overcome the force of the air pushing down on the water surface so again freezing point is the temperature at which water changes to a solid and the freezing point of water is 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius. Water expands and becomes less dense when frozen, which is why ice floats. Again, not all compounds do this. The addition of solutes lowers the freezing point. So what that means is kind of like the, it works from almost the opposite perspective from what you might realize. And there's a video that I can put into the module to demonstrate this. So think of, for those of you that grew up in the Northern New, Jer New Jersey area in the winter time, we have snow, it gets really cold. And what do the municipalities do before a big snowstorm is supposed to happen? They send out the trucks that either spray a salt solution or they just spray salt onto the road. Now, the salt is not meant to, this is what it looks like is happening, but it's not meant to melt the ice. It's not melting the ice. It's the addition of the salt is lowering the freezing point of the water. So the ice that you see on the road has salt added to it and it starts to melt because the mixture of the salt and the water together would freeze at a lower temperature. That's also, if you wanted to super chill something, or even if you've, many of you have probably tried to make ice cream at home, if you need to, if there's like the shaker bowl, there's all different ways, but if you want to get ice to be colder than 32 degrees, you add salt to it, and that lowers the freezing point. And then you put it back in the freezer, and you could have, when you take it out, you could have super chilled, within reason, it's going to be colder ice. Okay. So melting point we know is when a solid starts to change to a liquid and the boiling point is the temperature at which a heated liquid begins to boil and changes to a gas. The boiling point of 
water is 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Important things to remember. Increasing the elevation decreases the boiling point of water. Increasing the atmospheric pressure raises the boiling point of water. So what does this mean? Basically, the higher up an elevation you go, the we know that if you go high up an elevation into the mountains, if you're at, uh, on top of Mount Everest, the air at that elevation, the air pressure is less than at sea level. So what this slide is not telling you is that the boiling point of water is 212 degrees Fahrenheit at sea level. For every 500, uh, 500 feet you go above sea level, you are decreasing the boiling point of water by one degree Fahrenheit. So if you're 500 degrees, I'm sorry, I keep saying degrees. If you're 500 feet in elevation above sea level, then water's gonna start to boil at, at 211. So, what you want to keep track of so that might be a little confusing because you're like well it's not as hot anymore it's one degree colder is it still boiling but that's when you realize that boiling is not really so much tied only to temperature that pressure also plays a role and as i mentioned in the earlier slides when we looked at this image where you could see the line on the you know the the water surface this the steam is starting to create and bubble through when it can overcome when the water molecules can overcome the pressure pushing down on top of the water holding it in place so if you're at elevation there's less less pressure pushing down so the water molecules are able to escape so you're going to see bubbling occur but the water is not going to actually be as hot as you think it might be uh, as you would think that it was at sea level uh, another thing to remember basically if the atmospheric pressure is increased so if you are below sea level you're going to have an immense amount of pressure pushing down on that water surface so you would need to have more to be able to so the water would be 212 degrees but you wouldn't see it bubbling you wouldn't see bubbles breaking the surface because the pressure of the air pressure on top of the water surface would be holding them all in place uh, as we talk more about water we have hard versus soft water hard water basically has a lot of minerals calcium magnesium these are you'll know that you have hard water if you go to when when you take a shower in the morning or at night whenever you take your showers and uh, or how, whenever throughout the day however many there are that you uh, that you take everyone's different anyway um if have you ever looked up at the shower head when you're taking a shower and you notice that maybe one or two of the little nozzles is clogged so water's coming out of all of them except for one or two, it might just be dripping. And there's like a white thing that looks like it's stuck in the in the nozzle in the in the hole of the, the shower head. That's basically a calcium deposit from the water. So it's it's a mineral buildup, and it, it's basically like rocks that you have to use solvents to to get rid of. But that's hard water. And soft water has a higher sodium concentration. So many times, many of you might even have a water softening system in your home that you didn't even realize what, what the purpose of it was. But it's essentially a tank that you fill with salt, big, large, you know, large crystal sized 
rock salt and water flows through that and that softens the water as it flows through your pipes to your faucets uh, at your kitchen sink, your bathroom sink, your shower heads, all throughout your home it softens the water. We're talking so much about water, but it really does amazing things on this planet for and is tied into everything that we do. So basically, more functions of water and food, it can act as a transfer medium for heat to actually cook the foods. It acts as a solvent to break different components of the foods down. It is important in chemical reactions and like I mentioned earlier, the amount of free available water has a direct impact on the perishability of food. So if you make the water that's in a food not available or remove it, that's one way to preserve the food. So again, here are some, here's a table for heat transfer. We have boiling, simmering, steaming, stewing, braising. As a solvent, there's different solutions like a colloidal dis uh, dispersion uh, or different solutions, chemical reactions. You have ionization, changes in pH, salt formations, hydrolysis. So the release, uh, CO2 release, and again, or carbon dioxide release and food preservation. So what in the world is a colloidal dispersion? So it is a solid particle dispersed into a liquid. And an example of that would be a gravy or jelly. So food preservation, like we discussed earlier, decreases microorganisms. And the reason for that is water activity, which is represented by the A with the subscript W, determines how quickly a food decays. More water activity means quicker decay. So water activity is the amount of free water. That's what we need to remember. So think about, just imagine we're gonna blow things up to a, we're gonna magnify things to a gigantic cartoonish scale. And so much so that imagine that we are, Think of us as like giant microorganisms. If we went into the ocean, how long would we survive? Can we drink seawater? No, because it has too much, too high of a salt content. So we cannot drink the water in the ocean. So we would not survive. When we shrink back down to the real real world scale, you could think about this as canned soup used to, and less so now because there's other preservation methods, used to have such high sodium contents. And it wasn't only because when you can soup, you lose the flavor. So people add in high doses of sodium to spike the flavor. No, it's because when you add the sodium, it binds that water to make the water unavailable for the microorganisms that need the water to survive, okay? So by adding salt or sodium to the water, it makes it unavailable. Another thing that you could do is just remove the water through drying or curing or uh, another process. We're gonna switch gears a little bit and go into carbohydrates. They're basically your sugar, starches, and fibers of food, predominantly found in plants. There are some animal sources of carbohydrates. One of them is lactose, which is the sugar that's found in milk. Another one, there's a little bit uh, of 
carbohydrate from meat in terms of glycogen, but it's not, it's not much. So basically lactose is one of your examples of a carbohydrate that is animal sourced. And they're made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So all the sugars, all the starches, all the fibers are differing amounts of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Carbohydrates are broken down into three categories, and it's based on the amount of carbons and the way that the molecules are linked to each other. So you have monosaccharides, which are just a six carbon atom, your glucose, fructose, galactose, then you have your pentoses, which are five carbon. So that's ribose and aribinose. Your disaccharides, which are two monosaccharides put together, sucrose, maltose, lactose. And your polysaccharides, you have undigestible and digestible. So these are your fibers. The digestible are the starches. Well, some of them are the fibers, I should say. Digestible starches amylose, amylopectin, and I mentioned glycogen earlier. That is, you could think about it as animal starch, but glycogen is the stored, the store, the stored form of carbohydrates in muscles and the liver in, in muscle tissue. Undigestible polysaccharides, we have cellulose, hemicellulose, pectin, gums, Inulin, these are all fibers that have different characteristics and we can manipulate them in different manners to thicken foods and do all kinds of fun things with them to add, add fiber, add texture, add bulk, turn a liquid into a, like a gelatin. So that's kind of what you're doing when you're making a gravy or a jelly or those types of things. So monosaccharides, you have ribose found in nucleosides in vitamin B2, arabinose, part of the structure of plants, glucose, which is starch and sugar, it's called dextrose when refined, and fructose, we know it's fruit sugar. Galactose is part of lactose. So glucose and galactose together makes lactose. So we have glucose, fructose, galactose. These are the structures. You will not be asked, ah, you might be, you will probably have to know what combined together makes what, but I'm not going to ask you to draw them in this class. So the disaccharides, you would probably need to know and they look like this. So if I asked you, if you put a glucose molecule and fructose molecule together, what do you get? You get sucrose. And lactose, like I said, is galactose and glucose put together. And maltose is just glucose and glucose. So maltose or malt sugar has a, is very sweet and is used in different different baking products and cereals and, and sometimes in beer making. Uh, oligosaccharides, so they are three to 10 monosaccharides linked together. Raffinose and stachyose, they're found in dried beans. So these are the things that basically, it says digesting them produces gas. These are, these are the reasons why you soak your beans before you cook them, if, you, if you're cooking dried beans. So if you want to see uh, your friend have some digestive uh, bloating, you would put the bean water into a glass and have them drink it after. I'm not saying you should do that, but that's basically like a high dose of these uh, not really digestible carbohydrates that are going to produce some, some, some intense 
uh, gas, which has to come out somehow. You have your fructo oligosaccharides, which uh, they're in fruits and vegetables, and they could be prebiotic. So prebiotic, as the name suggests, is it, they're fibers that as they are making their way through your digestive tract, they provide some nutrition for the microorganisms or the probiotics, uh, the gut flora. So that's, that's why they're there. That's what they're, they play an important role. Polysaccharides, again, we have starch. Glycogen is the stored energy in animals and people. Fiber, undigestible. There is no source of animal fiber. Fiber is only plant-based. We're moving on to fats and oils. Now, there are some exceptions to what I'm going to discuss on this slide. Fats are solid at room temperature. Oils are liquid at room temperature. Fats are usually derived from animal sources. Oils are derived predominantly from plants. Can you think of an example of a plant-based lipid that is solid at room temperature? Can you think of a animal-based lipid that is liquid at room temperature. So many of you probably said palm oil or coconut oil. They are plant-based, but at room temperature, they're solid. And fish oil is animal-based, but at room temperature, it's liquid. Foods high in lipids, typically animal sources, meats, poultry, dairy products. But there's different cuts, there's different parts of the muscle and organs that have varying degrees of lipids compared to protein. And plant sources, we know nuts, seeds, avocados, olives, coconuts. Triglycerides are three fatty acids attached to a glycerol molecule, and they make up about 95% of the lipids in foods. And fatty acids, the length is determined by the number of carbon atoms and saturation has to do with the amount of double bonds between the carbon atoms. So if a fat, fatty acid is considered saturated, there are no carbon double bonds because each carbon is saturated with hydrogen. As we look at this slide here, the first, the one on the top, we have a saturated fat. Some examples, again, meat, poultry, milk, butter, cheese, egg, yolk, lard. Plant sources, we have chocolate, coconut, palm oil, vegetable shorting. It is a saturated fat because every single carbon is saturated with, a hy with hydrogens. So every carbon, has to be attached to four things because it has in its outer valence electron shell it has four electrons but to be stable that electron shell needs eight electrons so if this c has four then it picks up one from the hydrogen so five from the hydrogen, six from the carbon next to it, seven from this hydrogen, and eight from the carbon next to it. So it shares those electrons. Now its outer valence shell is full, so it's stable. So it's not that carbon prefers this. Carbon must do this. All elements must 
have their valence shells, the outer valence shell, filled with electrons to stabilize. So they share electrons. Monounsaturated fat. So if we know that saturation has to do with double bonds, it also has to do with hydrogen. So if we look down here, monounsaturated, mono means one, so there's one double bond. And examples are avocado, peanuts, peanut butter, olives, olive oil, canola oil, which is rapeseed oil. So when you look at this example, you see that in the middle, there's a double bond between the carbons and two hydrogens are missing. So it is unsaturated because saturation re is related to the amount of hydrogen. This is saturated, if we go back up to the top one, it's saturated with hydrogen. Every carbon has, is attached to another two carbons and two hydrogens. But when we go back down to this monounsaturated, there is a carbon double bond between two carbons. Now, why is there a double bond? We go back to the reason. So why would there be a double bond between the carbon? Because carbon needs to have four additional electrons in its valence shell, on, in the outer shell. So this carbon is one, this hydrogen is two, or I should say five, six, seven, eight between those two double bonds. So this carbon that I'm looking at, the one on the left, uh, the left of the double bond, has an additional four electrons to make eight total, so it is stable. When we go down finally to look at Example C, polyunsaturated, which means two or more, then we're looking at two or more carbon double bonds in, an, in the structure. So sources are vegetable oils, again, corn, safflower, soybean, sunflower, canola, margarines, mayonnaise, almonds, filberts, pecans, walnuts, there are a lot of different examples, but it's polyunsaturated. So there's gonna be two or more carbon double bonds, which means there's less hydrogen. So let's, and another way that you could think about this, saturated, the saturated fats will, are solid at room temperature, right? Monounsaturated, an example would be peanut butter, have you ever purchased peanut butter from the store where you grind it yourself? Or even almond butter, which has even fewer, it has even more carbon double bonds. If you've ever purchased a, a natural peanut butter or almond butter, when you bring it home, there's the, the butter like the ground nuts, and then on top of it is a layer of oil. So what you have to do is stir that oil back in to get it back to a, a butter, peanut butter consistency. So those, that's a lot of the, the, the fat, the lipids that are rising up, they float on the top, okay? So, that is how almond butter and peanut butter and all these products look naturally. The oil separates, so when you open the container, you have to stir it back in and get it to be mixed. And sometimes it's a pain, especially when you open a new container. There's not a, it's, it's hard to mix in the top. You know, the first few days of eating peanut butter, the peanut butter is really thin. And then by the end, it can be really thick and kind of clumpy because you didn't mix the oil properly, which is kind of a pain. So some people aren't willing to deal with the pain, uh, the inconvenience of having to stir it. 
So companies came up with the awesome idea of hydrogenating the oil. So, or partially hydrogenating the oil. So when you look at a label and you see partially hydrogenated oil, what that, what, well, what do you think that means? Hydrogenated, it means the addition of hydrogen. So what they're doing is forcing those carbon double bonds to break and adding hydrogen in their place. So you would have an oil that starts off looking like this monounsaturated in the case of the peanut butter or polyunsaturated in the case of the almond butter where it has carbon double bonds. Those carbon double bonds are being broken and hydrogens are being introduced in their place. And again, the hydrogens attach to the carbons because the carbons will grab for them because they need to have four electrons and they're out an additional four electrons in their outer shell to stabilize. Okay. So once that is set up, the product that started off as unsaturated is now basically a solid at room temperature. And that's due to the addition of the uh, hydro. That's part of the hydrogenation process itself. There, which 15 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, people, consumers started to say, that's not really healthy. I don't want hydrogenated oil or I don't want to feed hydrogenated oils to my children. So, but the task of stirring up the peanut butter every day is just too time consuming. I want something that's smooth and spreads easily and doesn't separate. So food scientists answered back with a natural peanut butter that doesn't separate, that doesn't need stirring. And instead of a partially hydrogenated oil, they just added palm oil because palm oil is a saturated fat. So if you add palm oil to the peanut butter, it's going to stabilize it. So it's doing the same thing. They're, they're still able to call it natural because they're using another ingredient that wasn't made through a chemical reaction. But it's still, it's still a magic trick. It's still, it's still changing it. You're just, you're taking away those double bonds and, you know, forcing it's, it's still turning it into a saturated fat is essentially what I'm trying to say. So there are phospholipids, which we are important in terms of emulsification and emulsifiers. So when we have an emulsion or something that uses an emulsifier, it's putting a water soluble, there's water soluble and fat soluble things that wouldn't normally mix together. And um, an emulsifier like soy lecithin or lecithin found in egg yolks helps hold the products together. So emulsifiers have a water loving and water fearing property so that you can disperse the molecules either in water or oil. So the water loving is called hydrophilic and the water fearing is hydrophobic and they line up around the molecules and keep things in that dispersion. Proteins also contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. But one of the biggest differences between, the, between lipids and carbohydrates is protein contains nitrogen. Amino acids make up the proteins. There are 22 amino acids, nine are essential. So essential um, amino acids are ones that we do not produce ourselves. So we need to 
consume them from our diet. Which brings us to complete versus incomplete proteins. Most animal proteins are complete, which mean they provide the nine essential amino acids. Uh, many plant proteins are incomplete, so you need to combine different foods to get all of the essential amino acids. One of the oldest examples of this is rice and beans. You put them together, you have your, all your essential aminos. So in another class, you will have to memorize these. And I think you even have to draw their structures out. But you don't need to do that here. But this information is good to know if, especially if you are eating plant-based foods for a meal or all of your meals, to know what is needed to make a complete, to complete uh, or meet all of your non-essential amino acid requirements. Also, and I think we're gonna talk about this a little bit with the labeling or product labels, um, ingredient products that show their protein content coming from wheat. Um, does wheat contain all of the essential amino acids? And if so, what, and if not, you know, which ones are missing? So if you're looking at different protein shakes or whatever it may be, just the, the amount in grams that's listed may not really mean much of anything because if it doesn't have all of the essential amino acids, your body can't do as much with it as you think it could or that it's marketed to do. So it's something to take a look at. Um, if you wanted to look on your own now, you could even think about or look into the amino acid profile of collagen, of pea protein, of soy protein, of wheat, of, and, and in particular, gluten as a protein source. What do the amino acid profiles look like? Some that I mentioned have the complete profile, some do not. Proteins are important. You need them for browning. Basically, it's the proteins and the carbohydrates together that gives you browning in foods. It's called the Maillard reaction. And I'm going to go over this uh, in a later chapter as well. Um, hydration, denaturation, coagulation. So basically, when you, when you cook eggs, if you crack an egg into a pan and the white starts to change its shape and become more solid. It's coagulation. There's also enzymatic reactions. Vitamins and minerals. Vitamins contain carbon, so they're organic. They can be destroyed by heat, light, and oxygen, and they are non-caloric. Minerals are non-organic, meaning they, don't, they do not contain carbon. But the minerals are on the periodic table of elements. They're, they're, they're elements. Uh, they cannot be destroyed by heat, light, or oxygen, and they're also non-caloric. So fat-soluble vitamins, we have A, D, E, and K. And then water-soluble, we have your B vitamins, vitamin C, Basically, fat-soluble vitamins, you have to pay more attention to the tolerable upper limits of the vitamins and also the, the thresholds for uh, where you could have, um, basically the tolerable upper, upper limit is how much you can consume before you have negative effects. Um, because these vitamins bioaccumulate, they accumulate in, in your fat. Water soluble vitamins have a much higher tolerable upper limit, typically, because 
if you consume too much of one of them, you're going to excrete it in water or, or urine. Not saying that you could take super duper high doses all the time or that you should of the water soluble vitamins, but your body has a way of um, ridding them with less negative impact on your body typically than the fat soluble vitamins. So you definitely don't want to overdo the fat soluble. Okay. Looking at the macro minerals present in the body in large amounts, calcium, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, sodium, chlorine, magnesium. These are all in your bones. They're all in your blood. Uh, small levels, fluorine, chromium, molybdenum, or molybdenum, sorry. Iodine, copper, manganese, selenium, zinc, iron. Now I feel like I'm reading off uh, the ingredient statement on a, on a multivitamin. So these, we don't, micro, they're not in such a large amount, but the macro, these are really in our bodies, circulating freely, bound in our muscles, bound in our bones, in our blood. In terms of vitamins and minerals and food processing, we've talked about this on the first day, enrichment is when you add certain nutrients back to a product when those nutrients were lost during the process, typically in grains. So when you process wheat, flour, you have to enrich it by adding the vitamins back to it and minerals. Fortified, the example that I think we uh, discussed in class was the orange juice with calcium orange juice or oranges by nature don't contain uh a, the daily recommended intake levels of calcium but you can purchase orange juice with calcium so it's fortified with the right amount of calcium um, so in summary the six major nutrient groups, water, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, minerals, vitamins, and your non-nutritive food components.